here with P2TK9 and we're getting ready to go from practical to tactical with another dog talk. First, a few administrative notes. First of all, what did you think of the opening graphic and the music? Uh, the opening graphic was designed by my wife Brandy. Uh, I think she did a great job with that. Her concept with the small moving parts in the background uh, that is to represent all of the very small relationships uh, in the dog training and how all of this develops and builds out into a larger picture. So her concept was all of these small pieces coming together. Uh, she had three different selections of music available. This one was on her short list. Absolutely loved it right away. I said, that's, that's the one I've got to have. So if you liked it, uh, leave a comment. Uh, that was all her setting it up, and I think it's a great addition to the videos. Additionally, P2TK9, we are an equipment company, and when I say we, I mean me, the wife, and the daughter. Uh, without the efforts of the wife, there'd be no website, uh, no videos, or any of the other neat stuff that helps this be an actual operating company. Go over to P2TK9.com. Check out my new Double Dog Dare You two dog leash. Also, our cutaway bungee hip lanyard. You will not find anything better on the internet. I promise you that. I am selling these at $100 each for as long as I can possibly keep the price that low. You will not find a better deal on the internet. Go do your research, conduct your homework, then come back and put in an order. Multiple colors available any hardware that you want on the dog in, let me know, send me an email, and I will get that out to you right away. So, today's dog talk, gonna do a quick time check. Wanna try to keep these videos uh, at their current length. Uh, I wanna go into detail, uh, really establish the information, the bona fides, uh, show how these pieces all work together and paint the picture of, no, I'm not just doing some drive-by information shooting from the hip. With that being said, um, this kind of was on my radar anyway, but it really uh, was spurred along by some messaging from Troster at Frequency K9 down in the Panhandle of Florida. Please do check them out if you're in the area and you need some quality dog training, uh, pet owner training specifically. Uh, so I wanted to start digging into this subject and it's going to be a multi-part series because it is too complex, uh, too many interrelated pieces to hold it to just one video. Uh, but this is information that every pet owner and every canine professional can benefit from. So with that being said, uh, let's go ahead and do some disclaimers. The information that I'm giving you is some propriety information, proprietary information of my own, uh, information that I've gained from others over the years. Um, I have developed uh, these training concepts and opinions over the course of 24 years, uh, and in some cases, hundreds, even thousands of repetitions, uh, multiple dogs, um, these things performed in, in many countries around the world. So with that being said, let me follow that up with Nobody knows. Nobody knows. I don't even know. Why do we say that? Because dogs can't talk. Anyone who tries to tell you uh, this is a drive that a dog is operating from, this is exactly what they're thinking, this is exactly uh, how they view things, the, these people aren't intellectually honest to begin with because dogs can't talk to us. We can't debrief them. Uh, the best we can do is to work with them, train them, get the feedback and see what the actual results are through the training and use of the dogs in their trained roles or just living with them day to day as a pet in order to come up with language uh, definitions and descriptions of things to try to explain to other people what we're doing, how to replicate those results and why we are training in the, the method and uh, way that we are. So with that being said, I'm going to throw words and vernacular out there. Some of it uh, I've gotten from other places. Some of it um, I've developed on my own to try to have that explanation. 
uh, but I'm, I'm not the be all end all and nobody knows they can't talk. So with that being said, um, I want to steal repurpose a little bit of a moving line from Sicario 2. If you're a, a dog owner, a pet owner or a dog handler at that point, you are telling time. Once we start getting into these concepts and this discussion, we're getting ready to move in how to build a watch. And the difference between the two and uh, the complexity between the two really is befitting of the movie line uh, from Sicario 2. So with that being said, I want to start explaining uh, where all of the things that we use in a dog's world, what what we're tapping into to modify behavior, uh, why in my experience that that holds true, and where it goes off the rails for most people. So let's start with where does it go off the rails? And again, my company and my philosophy is based on dogs are dogs. There is way more overlap and common area between dogs as a pet and working dogs as, as canine professionals then there are differences. So a lot of people get this stuff wrong. Our number one enemy being anthropomorphic, the act of being anthropomorphic, anthropomorphism. What do I mean by that? That is where we try to place human values, human explanations on animal behavior. And of course, in this arena with our dog talk, specifically dog behavior. Dogs do not think the way we think. Dogs do not see the world the way we see the world. There, there is no debate in that. Um, and I will tell you, I am absolutely no hater. In fact, I, I really enjoy a lot of what Caesar Milan does. If you go back and if you stay through the entire video and the series related to it, then go back and look at some Caesar Milan. You're going to see in most of these cases what he's really doing is fixing anthropomorphic behavior between the owners of the dog and the dog themselves. Everyone keeps trying to explain what the dog is doing or deal with them in terms of a human. Dogs do not see the world that way. When I train guys, uh, I am still currently a full-time professional trainer. Uh, that's my, my main source of income, paying the bills. For many years, I have told guys, this is oversimplified and reductionist, but it is 100% accurate. Once you learn how a dog sees the world and you really wrap your brain around that, everything else is downhill because there is, there is nothing more complicated about it than learning how a dog sees the world and being able to package information in a way that they will understand to get the outcome that you are looking for. Uh, people think they're pack packaging information for the dog to modify behavior and get a training outcome or live with them day to day and then it goes horribly wrong because you are not presenting the information in a way that makes sense to the dog with the way they see the world. You're presenting it in human terms with human values the way you see the world and that is not accurate. Example. So um, going way back in time, we're, we're going many years back now to the beginning. Uh, a great deal of my foundational basis, I can already hear the boos and the heckling from the comment section coming. Don't act like some of you out there do not have the same information and did not come from the same school. Uh, my first dog training and dog came from Bonlet Kennels in Denver, Indiana. And I learned a great deal starting out about the fundamentals from Ken Licklider and a whole bunch of people did. Uh, let's not pretend like a, a lot of working programs out there right now are not based on his concepts and his training because they are. Uh, so with that being said, the first thing that he teaches, dogs learn in this linear fashion. A equals B equals C directly in that fashion. So what does A equals B equals C add up to? Stimulus, response, reward. A is the stimulus, B uh, is the response, and C is the reward. 
once you start packaging information and presenting it to the dog in that linear fashion, timing is everything and we're going to touch on timing, the timing of the C, the reward. When you reward and when you correct, speak volumes to the dog with the way they process information about how they are going to receive that information and whether they are going to modify behavior in the way that we want them to or uh, in a way that, that they took that information and it is not the outcome that we're looking for. So that's the first thing. If you screw this up, if you take the B out or um, the timing is off, do you know what going from A to C and finding the value of B is? That's algebra. People do algebra. People can go from A to C and then work backwards and find out what the value of B is. Dogs cannot. People do algebra, dogs don't. So your training and your corrections have got to be in that linear fashion. It is very time sensitive. If you have a break in the stimulus response reward and something else happens or is made available to the dog between any of these, these phases, the stimulus, the response, and the reward, and you pay or correct on that outcome, the dog is not learning the lesson that you think that they're learning. So this is absolutely crucial. Next piece of information, the law of three. When I started uh, with my first dog at Von Lick Kennel, uh, when you start tracking training, tracking is always done until you start really getting the dog going the right direction with the tracking and you're really building time and distance uh, until you reach that point, everything is done in sets of three. Uh, three is really, for most dogs, a magic number. Uh, there, there is, in some cases, such a thing as one repetition learning for dogs. That's entirely possible. But if you get three good reps and your stimulus, response, reward are really in agreement with each other and you start hitting these cycles of three, the dog is really starting to process and learn information and that information is taking root. Um, for example, if you have uh, door handles on your house or a push release on your storm door, if a dog jumps up and slaps that with their paw one time accidentally, it might result in, in one repetition learning where they can figure out how to open the door on their own. Maybe they're just jumping up in an excited manner and as they're falling back down under the force of gravity, their paw hits a door handle and it flaps and it pushes open and they get out. Um, one might not be a deal breaker. If they do this even by accident three times, we are definitely in the, the area where they are going to learn this. So repetitions of three. Now we're getting ready to bring up another concept. Law of primacy. Law of primacy states that first learned is best learned. You may know it by another name. There might be other language out there, but law of primacy is absolutely a real thing. Law of primacy states first learned is best learned. So what do we mean by that? And how does that affect us as both pet owners and working canine professionals? We need to control that stimulus response reward present information in a way a dog understands so that once this information begins to take root, they have the right information and we're getting the right result the first time. With first learned is best learned, now information has entered their little golf ball brain. If you want an explanation on golf ball brain, go back to video number two. Uh, their brain is approximately the size of a golf ball and while they are intuitive and smart in some things, they're, they're really working at a pretty low level. So when first learned is best learned, that information goes in and it's not the information we want. Now we have to go back and keep working to correct that information and overwrite, if you will, overwrite that bad information with the new correct information that we want. Now we have added a lot of extra time and frustration to our procedure. And once in a while, uh, because now we get into, if you've screwed up your first learned is best learned and we're overriding information, now we have to bring up extinction training, which means where we have given the dog new information, we have 
bad behavior or bad information we don't want them to act on and we go through a series of steps over time to make sure that that old unwanted behavior doesn't resurface. Extinction training means we have walled off that possibility of acting on that old training, that old information, and acting out on that bad muscle memory to the point that it goes extinct. It goes the way of the dinosaur, it's gone and it doesn't come back. Uh, in some cases, this could take a very extended amount of time. Uh, once in a while, a dog will have a little glitch in that golf ball and that old piece of information will come back up to the top and they're going to try one more time to see if I can get some kind of positive result, a reward, an outcome that they want on that old piece of information. Uh, perhaps situationally, they see some things taking place in the environment around them. We'll let the Harley go by. Yes, we hear the pipes, they're lovely. Thanks so much. So we're waiting over time uh, sometimes uh, on pins and needles to make sure that that bad behavior does not show back up and create an issue for us. So we're hoping that we've walled off that old, old information, we haven't allowed it to manifest again and that it's gone for good, uh, but you always have to be watching for it and cognizant, cognizant of it for an extended period to make sure it doesn't make its way back. Uh, so that is extinction training in a nutshell and that is most often required to be utilized once you have bad information in the dog's brain. So we want everything to go the right way. We want to present things in a fashion they can understand. And we don't want to have to call on Caesar Milan to come to our house at great expense and deconflict everything that the dog has figured out that we don't want them to know. So what are the methods that we modify a dog's behavior? Uh, again, this is from the Von Lick School by Ken Licklider, um, but I absolutely believe in it. Um, I have given briefings and dissertations on this for many, many years now. And again, going back to that 24 years of experience with all of the field experience, um, I hold by this. I, I think it's good information. Let's just start with the categories. Four things food, water, sex, and air. That's all that matters to a dog. Anything else that you put into that, you're being anthropomorphic or you don't understand the relationship of that item to these four categories, food, water, sex, and air. So let's start number one with food. Food absolutely means food. It means a consumable, uh, kibble, treats, um, bill jack, pepperonis, milk bones, whatever you want to give them, training treats, uh, anything that is an outright consumable for a dog is food. What are things that we don't consider food that absolutely in the mindset of a dog and especially going back to the wild origins, the original DNA of a dog, what is food? Uh, it is also a toy. Uh, if you have a high drive dog who likes to you on a Kong toy, a tennis ball, um, chuck it balls, any of the above, they chase it, they grab it, and if they start chewing it after the fact, this is absolutely them going through the capture and consumption of prey after the fact. If they are chewing up a tennis ball into little pieces, um, if they aren't consuming it, you're lucky. Uh, some dogs that are extremely high in prey drive will continue to consume that because in the process of catching food, step A is to catch it, which is us throwing the ball, their pursuit of the food, capturing the food, and then to tear it up into pieces and consume it. Uh, that's why with really high drive dogs in the working arena, uh, we have to be careful, make sure our reward items are durable, and if they are uh, are able to be chewed up and broken down, that it's not big enough to cause a bowel obstruction and it's either digestible to the dog or only comes apart in tiny pieces uh, that the dog can pass. But yes, toys are absolutely part of the food category. Uh, and, and we'll dig deeper into this. If you are a canine working professional and you are teaching your dog bite work, then yes, a person in a suit, a decoy, uh, an agitator, this is also food. 
Uh, this is why they go through tracking training. This is why they will carry out tracking training. And this is why when they uh, grab it and hold on to the decoy, uh, if they were to slip the equipment, many dogs will continue to tear at the suit or the protective material and tear it into shreds and in some cases consume it. So food is a very, very broad category of both things that are edible and consumable and things that uh, are not really what we would perceive as food, but dogs are acting out in a way that is natural to them for these inanimate objects. Um, I wanna take a quick sidebar for a second and uh, I don't wanna get too far off course while working doing uh, service dogs at the Warriors Heart Ranch in Texas, uh, there was an intern there by the name of Abby, super sweet girl, a recent high school graduate at the time, uh, kind of a geeky gal, but I liked her a lot. And she got all of my Star Wars and Star Trek references, no matter how obscure, which I appreciated very much. Um, but I was giving her this same explanation uh, and she asked me a question, this would have been 2017, that up until that point, no one had ever posited to me before. And she says, well, from the viewpoint of nature, when you look at, we'll say Darwin, for example, isn't a dog that has a high prey drive and will work for inanimate objects in the eyes of nature, is that dog not flawed? And I said, Abby, you're brilliant. Uh, that is a concept that no one had ever brought up to me before. And the more I thought about it in the moment, I said, you're absolutely correct. Uh, and all of our working professionals will be able to understand this quickly. If you have a dog that will work until the point of heat injury, exhaustion, uh, GDV, GDV, which is known as the bloat, if they will work until they have an injury that is life-threatening for an inanimate object that is not a consumable, that cannot be eaten for calories to sustain them, they are out burning calories and carrying out training for an inanimate object that does not provide sustenance to their body. In the eyes of nature, yes, I would have to say that that dog is deeply flawed. These are in fact the dogs that we put the most value on monetarily in the working arena. Uh, we pay the most money for these dogs. They're the most sought after. And then we take these dogs when it comes to trying to make prospects of litters that we hope have the same uh, traits. Those are the ones that we pick first are these dogs that will work themselves to death over something that provides no life sustenance whatsoever. So I just wanted to throw that side note in there that it is a real oddity that a dog that will work so hard for something that won't even keep them alive is the most prized dog that, that we look for certainly in the working community. So that's our food category. Now we're moving on to sex. Uh, in the wild, sex means sex. Uh, that is the social interaction uh, the interaction between uh, members of the pack in the wild, and of course, uh, the interaction to create litters in order to uh, continue the species. Uh, but it's not completely limited just to uh, the act of sex, but it is all of the ancillary things in the wild that go with that, uh, grooming other members of the pack, uh, caring for them, nurturing, then once we move into the pet owner working professional arena, this includes bathing, grooming, combing, petting, uh, talking uh, very nice to your dog. Uh, all of these other social interactions that we have with them uh, do fall into the sex category. And yes, these are things that we can use to manipulate, modify and promote behavior, the petting, the interaction, uh, the emotional bonds that we create, these do absolutely fall into the sex category. Um, if you need me to prove that, why sometimes when you interact with the dog, when you're petting on them, uh, when you're grooming them, why do in some cases they become aroused? Male and female uh, dogs can both 
show that behavior in these settings. So um, it is absolutely a real thing. So water, water is obvious. Dogs have to have water. Every living thing must have water in order to continue. In the training arena, uh, do we normally use water um, to try to modify a dog's behavior? Not really. Um, in very few cases, I, nothing really comes to mind on a practical basis. The one thing that you can use to modify a dog's behavior uh, is if you import dogs or you routinely uh, go through um, the process of picking a dog, if it's at a rescue, um, if it's at a shelter, or if it's an imported dog and they have a little bit of an attitude, if they're not approachable right away, a dog can go for days and days. People say, well, I'm not gonna feed this dog and I'm going to chum it and throw some food to it and then feed it by hand in order to try to create a bond with it and get it to trust me and become more approachable. Dogs and humans can go extended periods without food. That timeline is way shorter with water. If you have a dog that has real, real attitude problems, dry them out. And I'm not talking about putting their life in danger. Don't, don't get it. Don't pull out your PETA card and start waving it at me. I'm talking about over the course of a day or 18 hours, if you have a dog that's kenneled that has no other way to get to water, if they have a bad attitude, you will get them closer to you and start interacting uh, with you way faster over that pan of water than you will trying to withhold food and make them take food from you. So that is really the only case uh, that I know of that's that's practical or, or even reasonable uh, with the water issue is to try to make inroads with a dog that's either abused, uh, super scared and defensive, or just has a chip on its shoulder because it's been recently imported and it's upset with you. So uh, we did the food, we did the sex, we did the water, now we do the air. Again, no waving PETA cards at me. Don't, don't have time for it. This is absolutely accepted training uh, in the professional environment. A correction collar that can cut off a dog's airway for a short time is a way to get them to modify behavior. Um, but we want to be ethical in these corrections. We need to be fair in these corrections. And we always have the dog's physical well-being and mental well-being top of mind. Can this be abused? Of course it can. All of it can be abused, um, any of these categories. But we do at times use a correction collar to take away a dog's airway to get compliance in some forms of training, and then we give the airway back. So in the stimulus response reward model, uh, if this dog is giving a response that they are non-compliant or is a bad response, we can take away that airway for a short time as soon as we get compliance from the dog, return the airway, and now we are setting up the dog to learn A equals B equals C, and we can absolutely modify their behavior. So let's talk about how these things go off the rails, both for pet owners and for working professionals. Um, I, again, this is a super, super complex subject with many interrelated parts. I, I led with that straight off of the top. I don't want to stay or go too far afield. I want to try to keep this thing linear with behavior modification. But if we are owning a dog as a pet owner or we are training and modifying behavior as a working professional, we are spending a lot of time with this dog and now it is part of our daily lives. And if we start screwing up behavior modification, if we are being anthropomorphic and we are confusing how we're presenting information to the dogs, you're going to have problems, whether it's practical or tactical and all points in between, we're going to start having unwanted behaviors and issues. I want to speak specifically uh, to sharing your home, your environment with your dog, and especially in a multi-dog household. So both sides of the fence, pet owners and working professionals, we know from the model of the wild that there is the alpha of the pack and then there is the rest of the pack. In the pack, is there a pecking order? No, there is not. If you have an alpha 
who then has a Bravo, a Bravo or Beta, B, C, D, E, F, G, down the line, now you have a pecking order. Pecking orders are not useful for a dog pack. If you have an Alpha and he is in control of the pack, and this is a B, C, D, E, F, G down the line, when it comes time to orchestrate a movement or go on a pack hunt or some kind of other collective activity, nothing is gonna get done if there's a pecking order where things descend in rank structure going down the line. There is only room for one Alpha, only one of us is in charge, everyone else is an even Bravo. Why is this important? Because if it is not an even set of Bravos under the control of one Alpha, who's clearly the, the, the Alpha, the Alpha is gonna starve and the pack is going to fall into chaos and dissolve because there, there is no order. Everyone's wasting time and calories in fighting. So wild dogs, when they hunt as a pack, they will go out as a group. Uh, they, they make everyone's effort um, better because they spread out in a line, they hunt upwind, they locate prey, whether it's alive or dead. Everyone, uh, when coyotes howl, when wolves howl, they're signaling uh, an alert to this food item, everyone collapses down. In the wild, who eats first? The alpha. The alpha eats first because they are the lead dog, they are in charge, they go first. Does the alpha eat everything? No, it does not. If the alpha who eats first ate everything, the pack is going to starve. If the pack is going hungry, one of two things is going to happen. They're either going to dissolve or they're going to break up and, and move away from the alpha or they may even challenge the alpha because they're doing a very poor job of resource management and we're having problems within the pack. The alpha eats first because they're in charge. They want this sign of dominance to be the first uh, to, to get to resources in front of the pack, but then they do want to make sure that there, there is uh, sharing amongst the rest of the pack so that the pack is healthy, strong, ready to follow the alpha's leadership, and they don't dissolve or challenge his authority. So this is, this is very important on many, many, many levels. Uh, so when you're talking about a working dog, everyone says, well, if you're, if you've got a working dog, you need to be the alpha and they have to be subordinate to your will. That is correct. This also needs to be the case in the home. If you want to be a pet owner with a healthy relationship with your pet, you have to be the alpha. They are the Bravo. I don't care. Uh, how much you care for them, how much they're your fuzzy baby, um, whatever your emotional bonds are, there still has to be this rank structure for things not to go off the rails, and we're going to get into that. So, uh, with that being said, the dogs have to start to trust us. There is a concept that is out there in the canine community called the alpha role. When this is brought up, it is most often uh, misused, not well understood, and just completely mishandled. Uh, when people say you need to alpha roll that dog, they are saying alpha roll, R-O-L-L, -L, roll them over and put them upside down. There are trainers out there who will tell you you need to pick your dog up by the collar, maybe choke them a little, maybe not, flip them upside down on their back, and then you need to MMA style, full guard mount them, straddle your dog across the midsection and hold them down upside down while you look over top of them. And there are trainers out there who will tell you this is the proper alpha roll, R-O-L-L. Alpha roll is R-O-L-E. It is the role of a dog showing who the alpha is and showing their submission to their dominance and their authority in the wild. This is a public display in front of other members of a pack or even a species, if you're talking about other animals, where in a public setting, the dog will roll over on its back and alpha roll, R-O-L-E, 
show its submission to the dominant member in front of the others so that everyone sees there is no more challenge for their leadership in this setting. If you go and you look at uh, footage of coyotes, of wolves, uh, feral dogs, if there is a fight, this dog, the loser, is going to roll over on its back and sh make its vitals available, make itself vulnerable, and say, I want no more of this confrontation, and I am showing everyone here present that I submit to your authority. That is very important to understand. Um, if you have a good relationship with your dog, um, and I don't mean, you know, just a really soft puppy who you go to pet it and it flops over on its side and it might pee a little. That is, in fact, an alpha role. Um, it is saying you're larger. I submit to your authority. I feel like you are psychologically and physically dominant to me. And I'm just going to roll over and show you my belly because I'm not being confrontational. Even with a very tough working dog, your dog should have no problem going into the down and rolling over on its side as you pet it in a ethical, pleasing manner. I'm not saying flip them over on their side and make this a, a forced encounter because it's not. Again, in the wild, this is a voluntary behavior. It's not a forced physical dominance of the dog. Um, so the way you achieve this is through executing fair and ethical behavior in all other aspects that, that we're covering uh, in this dog talk, and the dog will make that available to you. And this is where we start to be able to handle multiple dogs, whether they're working dogs or if they're pets, because you have to have that proper relationship and other dogs present have to all be on equal footing. The biggest problem uh, for working professionals who have both a working dog and a pet at home or pet owners who have multiple pets at home thinking that there is some kind of, oh, they'll work it out amongst themselves. Um, I never get more stressed out or dismayed than to be at someone else's house when they are an owner of multiple dogs and the two dogs begin to skirmish and I hear the skirmish escalating and they say, oh yeah, yeah, they do that all the time. They're just gonna work it out. No, they're not. They, they are not going to work it out and you do not have a well-balanced pack a la Caesar Milan. You do not have all Bravos working under equal footing who are at your command because now you think that uh, the pecking order is somehow in play and that they're going to sort it out on their own. Nothing could be further from the truth. Uh, something that I have done my entire working dog career is handle multiple dogs by myself at one time that are all patrol, offensive, aggression, trained dogs uh, who are trained to bite. And I have, I have choked on the disinformation and lies my entire career that, oh, because a dog is aggression trained, then it's okay if they're aggressive to other animals, other dogs, because, well, obviously they're trained to bite and that just is baked into the cake. No, it is not. No, it is not, and no, it is not. Um, there is no reason that an aggression-trained dog should be aggressive towards other dogs just because. There is no part of their aggression training where they're taught to fight other dogs. This is all misinformation put out by people who don't understand it, can't do it themselves, and then they want to poo-poo the concept because they don't want to humble themselves and ask, hey, how do you do that? Hey, that looks really useful. They say, oh, well, his bite dog is softer than my bite dog, and that's the only reason he can get away with it. Uh, no, it's not. Um, I worked in a soft MPC kennel where I picked every single dog, and yes, I could make all of them get out together at one time under my supervision and not have problems. Then I went to another soft MP MPC kennel where I had picked none of the dogs that were present, and I got to where I could have all six of those dogs out doing the same thing that I've always done. They were all tough, strong bite dogs and I had picked none of them, pre-screened none of them and was still able to achieve the same result. So no, it is not baked into the cake. No, it's not because they're soft. And yes, you should be able to do that. And you need to be able to replicate that in your home environment if you are a multiple pet owner. So, 
How do these things go horribly wrong for most people? What is the basis for a call to Caesar Milan in most episodes of his TV show? This is where people start allowing the role of the pet and the role of the owner or the working professional handler to become inverted and flipped. Can you allow your working dog into your house and live inside with you? Yes, you can. Can you allow your working dog on the furniture? Yes, you can. If you introduce it and manage it the right way, yes, you can let them on the bed. Yes, they can sleep with you if you're so inclined. The answer is yes to all of those same questions in the pet arena. Where does it go wrong? It goes wrong when the dog does not recognize you as the alpha and instead of the proper relationship of I own everything, all of this, everything belongs to me and I allow you to enjoy it with me because you are my good canine companion partner at my good graces. Not because you're allowed to, um, because you're entitled, it's because of my good graces as the alpha, I'm improving your daily living situation because I am a benevolent alpha, period in. I never allow dogs on the furniture without my permission. If I'm walking to the couch and my pet or my working dog starts onto the furniture ahead of me, I'm, I'm not going to abuse them, but in a fairly aggressive and assertive manner, I'm going to swat them back off the furniture and tell them to lay down. I'm going to sit down, my plate of food, my drink, the remote, the blanket, whatever it is that's going on with me, I'm going to sit down and nest and make myself comfortable, get my, my plate ready. I'm not going to let them crowd me. I'm going to make them lay there and watch me until I'm set. And this is pet or working dog. And then after they are calm and compliant and obedient, come on up here. Now I'm going to invite them closer into my environment, improve their position at my good graces. If a dog beats me to the bed and jumps into the bed ahead of me again, unceremoniously, I'm going to push them right off into the floor and put them in a down stay. When you are going to bed or it's TV time in the bed, get in the bed, get yourself comfortable. If they jump up there before being invited, shove them back off into the floor again and put them in a down stay until you are completely set. Don't be fighting for room. Don't be haggling over real estate in the bed. The bed belongs to you. You are inviting them up there out of your good graces because you are a kind and benevolent master. So when we do that, um, invite them up there, designate their spot. If they're up there on the pillow with you, if you're comfortable, and I don't mean comfortable as in socially okay with that, I mean physically comfortable. Don't fight for room in your own bed. This is already the relationship starting to invert. They are now becoming the alpha. I get the room that I want and you, peasant, will have to share this space with me. No, no, no. This is the point at where you have a working dog that their performance will start to deteriorate at work. Their obedience will start to deteriorate at work because they start to realize that they are in charge and they run the show and that bleeds over into the working arena. This is the point if you're a pet owner where people start to say, uh, I get into the bed and I'm with the dog and then my wife and or husband, the, the significant other in the household starts to approach the bed and the dog growls. I'm in the bed and my kid approaches the bed and the dog growls. The dog, and, and the anthropomorphic explanation is automatically, oh, the dog is defensive of me. This is my dog. The dog's closer to mom than it is to dad or vice versa. The dog is closer to dad than it is to mom. If they're already in bed with one member of the household and someone else approaches and the dog becomes aggressive in any way, now we have a problem because no, they're not defending you. They are telling these other subordinates who look like interlopers getting ready to enter the space, back off. This is my area and I run the show and I don't want you over here. Terrible. If you have kids, 
if you if you have a spouse or partner and you have kids every human in this situation is an alpha and all dogs are even bravos dogs are not allowed to aggress spouses or partners and they are certainly not allowed to aggress towards children or show any kind of defensive um behavior against children that's that they we've already had this thing going upside down at this point uh, another huge pitfall if if you do have spouses or kids everyone has to be on the same sheet of music if we are all not doing the same thing and holding accountability in the same manner this is where the system falls apart you can get all of the quality training you want but if you have a member of the household undermining the system, the dog is always going to push where there's mush. They're going to find that gap in the fence, the soft chink in the armor, and they're going to find a way to end around the discipline and the obedience in order to get that easy outcome, that path that they're looking for, uh, where, where they get the most benefit for the least amount of effort. Um, we call this in dog training avoidance. And there are different kinds of avoidance and different ways that it will manifest. But if you're, and let's keep it simple for the moment, you're in a two-person household. Uh, one of you is really good at maintaining obedience and holding the other, the dog accountable, and the other is not. If they're soft, then that dog is going to go into avoidance, i.e. try to end around the one who is providing the accountability and the obedience and push where there's mush and go to the other person where they don't have to do all of the mean things that the other partner makes the dog do that they think's not nice to the dog when in reality it's actually a healthier relationship and keeps the dog more mentally well balanced. So with this being said, food, water, sex, and air, the sharing of the bed, the sharing of the furniture, this absolutely is a category that falls underneath that sex category. It is the interaction, the social relationship, uh, the closeness of the pack, and this has got to be handled appropriately. With the food, our dogs at this point are domesticated. If we have a working dog or a pet, they no longer have to go out and hunt for food or secure their own nutritional value in order to stay alive. We provide that for them on their behalf. With that being said, you have two kinds of dogs, really. Uh, the kind that will self-regulate their, their food intake, and then ones that have to have their food intake regulated, they cannot free feed. Um, I've had both throughout my life. Um, if you've been on my Instagram or seen some of my other videos, you know our Malinois Thomas, Malinois name only. Low drive, not a high drive animal, he cannot self-regulate. That dog will eat every piece of kibble that he can get his paws on um, and gain weight out of control if it's available all the time. Uh, on the inverse side of that, I've had other dogs, Mouse and German Shepherds, uh, who sometimes even if you fed them a larger portion, two cups, uh, they would eat until the point of satiation and then they would just walk away from it. And if you left that food down all day, they wouldn't touch it again until they were hungry. Um, so unless you're pretty keen on figuring out if you have uh, a dog that will gorge or self-regulate, don't make food available all the time. Um, food should be served uh, twice a day, split their daily portion up into an AM, PM feeding, Make it available at that point only. If you want to do a single uh, feeding a day, that's fine. Dogs aren't like people. They're not going to bed hungry. A dog can absolutely function on a 24 hour cycle. You can give them their full portion up front and they can go 24 hours to the next portion. That's absolutely a thing you can do. If for some reason uh, you want to put your dog on thirds and do breakfast, lunch, and dinner, you can do that. Find out what uh, portion is, is adequate and correct for your dog based on their breed, size, and activity level and break that into thirds. Hey, that's, that's on you. No big D. Well, but with that being said, don't make food available all the time. And by that, I mean the begging in the kitchen, the counter surfing. Just because you went and opened the drawer that has the 
cold cuts and cheese in it on the refrigerator and the dog comes running in there, doesn't mean that you have to make that available. Um, any food you share with them, again, has to be in the Alpha Bravo role. Make them do something. Do the place training. Put them on place somewhere in the dining room or in an area uh, where they can see you or not see you. It doesn't matter. Make them go to a good, obedient downstay. If they continue to crowd your personal space, oh, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, I want a treat. Oh, look how cute, it wants its piece of turkey. No, because now we are inverting that Alpha Bravo relationship and this dog is now prompting the interaction. Oh, there's food to be had? Who eats first in the wild? The Alpha. If they hear you opening the refrigerator and they can come in there and force the behavior to make you give them a treat before you have eaten or be aggressive or pushy, and I don't mean aggressive that they're growling at you or snapping at you, crowding your space, being underfoot, being in the way, they are now pushing the issue of feed me first, I want mine. And if you give into that, you are starting to invert this relationship and things are going to get worse and worse uh, over time. Make them go into calm, obedient, downstay and pay them for doing what you want them to do, improving their life by sharing your resources as the benevolent master. So with that being said, food, water, sex, and air, we're gonna hit them all with the sex. If your dog is jumping on the bed ahead of you, getting on the furniture first, or new one, when you're sitting watching TV, if your dog comes in and shoves its head under your arm and starts being a real nuisance, lifting your arms, hands, if it comes in, shoves its head under your leg and you ignore it, or it pushes its head between your legs and starts climbing up on you, do not entertain this behavior. Social interaction and the sex uh, category of this cannot be at their behest. They have signaled a need. I'm aware of their need, but I am going to fulfill that need as the benevolent master, as the alpha on my time schedule. If you allow this dog to come and start socially, physically interacting with you first, you have now inverted that relationship in another category. In the wild, and now we're gonna talk about sex sex, the actual procreation, who has sex in the pack as the alpha, the dominant male. If it's deer, why do deer fight? It's coming up uh, beautiful fall weather today. The rut will be upon us soon enough. These bucks, these deer are gonna go out and fight. Once they fight, they're going to establish dominance. Once they've established dominance, who's going to have the procreation, the sex with the does in the area, it's going to be the dominant, the dominant male gets the females. Same thing with your dog, same thing with the turkeys in the spring. We have these tests of strength, of physical prowess. The winner gets to have the sex and procreate in an attempt for the strongest genes to survive. So when we are in our house in a domesticated setting, when this dog is coming up and forcing physical social interactions with you, they are signaling a need. In the wild, if the alpha is approached by a beta and whether it's a male or a female, if they want social interaction, they do not just give it carte blanche. When you are a dog owner, working professional or pet owner, if my dog signals a need, I'm going to notice that need, but then I'm going to either go to place or downstay. I'm going to rebuff the initial advance and tell them no, because I'm the alpha. I don't have to make it an hour or a day. I'm not being punitive. I'm maintaining balance in the order. Downstay or place, maybe it's only 30 seconds. But what did I do? The alpha told you to go away, go over there and lay down. And once they become calm and focused and under control, come here, who loves you? Daddy loves you, that too. Come on over here and get some love. You signaled a need. I maintained order. I rebuffed the need. I made you understand that I'm in charge. And then once I call that dog over and I physically, socially interact with them, 
whose terms are, are, are they on? It's on my terms now, not on the dog's terms, and I'm maintaining balance and fulfilling that need. Uh, with the air, again, unless you're training and you're trying to modify uh, the dog's behavior in certain roles, this isn't something the pet owner has to worry about. Uh, we're not going to uh, take away the dog's need for air on, a, on any kind of a regular basis. So uh, the final one, water. Water is available 24 hours a day. Um, this is the one need that as the alpha, maintaining good order, um, even though I do not make food available to my dogs uh, 24 hours a day, uh, even for dogs that are capable of free feeding, uh, I want that social interaction of I am the alpha handing out resources. I will provide resources. What if they don't eat within a reasonable amount of time? Then I pick it up and I put it back in the bin until the next scheduled feeding cycle. The only thing that is available all the time, working dog or pet alike, is the water. And that is the one need that I will absolutely action right away. If I'm watching TV or I'm in the house and I hear the dog in there pawing at an empty bowl, if I hear an empty bowl clanking, if I hear uh, licking at a bowl that's empty or almost empty, I am Johnny on the spot. Oh, buddy, I'm so sorry. Dad's got you. Let me get you some water. My bad. I, I shouldn't have let it get that low. I provide that resource 24 hours a day and anytime the dog signals a need. I do not respond to uh, signals for food on their schedule. I do not respond to the sex advances, the need for social physical interaction on their schedule. I absolutely respond to uh, signals for water uh, when they need it. Uh, and, and that maintains a healthy relationship. So food, water, sex, and air. These are the things that we have at our disposal. Uh, everything else that we do absolutely falls into one of these categories. And these are the ways that we modify behavior and we maintain these healthy relationships with our dog. Quick time check. Man, the time goes by quick. Uh, I'm going to bring it in for a landing right there. We're going to continue this. Again, it's, it's a complex subject. It's a multi-part series. Um, the training, the modif modification, the A equals B equals C, stimulus, response, reward. All of these things, they build on one another, just like the intro with the little pieces coming together and moving towards each other. Uh, so we're going to get into communication, uh, specifics on the training. All of these things are coming. Um, if you've watched this far, unless it's your first day on the internet, you know what to do. And if it is your first day on the internet, welcome. And I'm glad that my video is one of the first ones you've watched. Uh, if you've made it all the way to the end, thank you again. Uh, feel free to comment or ask for uh, specifics. And again, if I could ask a small favor, check out the dog gear on the website, p2tk9.com. We will catch you again on another dog talk.